Hi, hello everyone. Uh, so good to have you all here. I'm very excited to have uh, with us today, Pasquale, Nicholas, and Kate, all of them coming from very cool backgrounds to share. Um, I'm just gonna give a quick intro of everyone. You know, Kate is working at SeedCamp. Uh, she's a Fulbright scholar. She, I, you know, she's uh, into education, sustainability, and audio journalism, which we're gonna get into in a bit. Um, Pasquale is an associate at North Zone. Um, he used to work at a company called Odd Industries. Um, and finally, Nicholas, uh, he's the founding partner at the Venture Collective and a co-founder of Head Start and also a Peter Thiel Fellow. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I would like to start just to, to learn more about each of you um, and learn how you became interested in tech uh, and how you got into, into the investing world. Um, Kate, do you want to start? Yeah, happily. No, thanks for, thanks for having us. Um, so my, so I've been in, I've been at SeedCamp for kind of a year and three months at this point. I started out as an intern, um, and really was not at all sure whether I was like going to go down that route, but I thought an internship at six months can't hurt. It's COVID. Let's be crazy. Let's move to London. Um, so that's what I did. And then I ended up staying just because, um, it was a really good culture fit. Um, venture proved to just be a really good way for me to do loads of different things at the same time and do a lot of context switching, which I think is, is what I love. Um, before that, I think, yeah, as you said, so I, I did a Fulbright uh, research fellowship in Hungary. Um, and back then was extremely passionate about journalism because I loved interviewing people and I loved kind of the educational component of being able to kind of like share, you know, share knowledge with the world through journalism. And I think part of the reason I love venture so much is because you get to basically interview founders 24 seven and ask really interesting questions, like try to get behind the founder's story, you know, understand, you know, key insights that drove them to start a given venture. And I think a lot of that has like ties to my passion for journalism. Um, so that was kind of my, my path in and obviously I've had a like a longstanding interest in tech because I think, you know, what moves and shakes up the world right now is things that transform it very quickly. And that's, you know, very associated to tech. And so venture was like a very good way for me to like access like my love for journalism and also be pursuing like super impactful technological ideas that are like shaping the world. So yeah, that's a little about why I'm interested in, in, in venture. That, that is awesome. And, I, and you bring a very good point about the link between journalism and getting behind the founder story, which we're totally going to go and dive, dive deeper later. Um, but actually, I want to move to to Pascual. Uh, why don't you just like get us um, up to speed on your story? Absolutely. So um, I'm from Chile. I I grew up uh, there, and um, I, I basically you know started my career in the U.S. in in management consulting, um, as a few other people in VC I think have done before. Uh, but I think interestingly when when i was recruiting uh for vc one of the things that that um surprised me was that what they cared most about was sort of operational experience and what happened after bain um, and so i basically went to work for this industrial ai company where i had to work on sort of launching a satellite uh for earth observation purposes in the climate tech space and so it was you know very very different stuff and way more interesting than sort of working on sort of petrochemicals in the Midwest. And so that's part of where, you know, um, a lot of what I think really excited me as a kid, and I, we can talk about more, more about that later, sort of came back and after sort of working at this company, I knew I wanted to surround myself by entrepreneurs and sort of emerging technologies. And I also think I have a very short attention span and sort of that worked really well with venture because I get to look at very different things in one day. Um, and I, I, I really enjoy that. And so I think much like Kate, and by the way, I think Kate's brother works with me at North Zone and he's one of my favorite people there. Uh, so I, I haven't met Kate, but I'm sure we'll get along. Uh, and um, yeah, I think, so my background academically is in political science and international relations. I, 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 I this past year did a, a master's program uh, called the Schwarzman Scholars that was you know focused on uh, China and the rest of the world and um, 
much of my sort of academic experience in many ways was around sort of how global trends shape societies. Um, and in many ways, I think technology is sort of one of the biggest trends there today. And so while sort of I'm not looking at golf tech very, very actively, I do think it sort of impacts everything and we can talk about it more. But, you know, I part of the reason, for instance, I'm interested in the metaverse has to do a lot with what I learned in political science. And so, yeah, to cut a story, long story short, that's sort of how I ended up uh, in venture. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I mean, later on, we're going to talk about some prophecies for the next year in tech. So I want to hear all those pitches <laughs> from you guys. Uh, but finally, Nicolas, why, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, um, you know, I, I ended up in, uh, in, in venture, I guess, through kind of being on the founder side of the table. So um, I kind of fell into it. I think intellectual curiosity is probably a fairly defining kind of characteristic of most people in venture. And I think um, you're building my companies. I had exposure to some categories, so ed tech and HR tech in a pretty deep way. Um, but I think as I started to angel invest pretty actively, um, you know, while I was building my second company in particular, I, you know, I think uh, it was it was kind of an inevitability. I think that that would kind of grow over time into being more on the institutional side. And so you know, I think for me, I love the fact that I can work with kind of mission driven founders every day who are focused on you know, driving. Um, if in, in our case, we focus on kind of deep positive impact through kind of transformative tech. So we're looking at everything that's kind of step chain shifts in big categories that uh, we think um, will drive you know, drive positive impact. And so we get to work with people that really have um, you know, a deep purpose behind what they're doing. And that kind of inspires us every day. And, and so that's kind of how I ended up uh, here. And um, yeah, lots of things to dig into. I, Pascal, I, I actually also um, spent a fair amount of time in China as well. So I was at PKU and, um, and yeah, so, so I'm sure there'll be some interesting things to talk about there as well. Awesome, perfect. Well, I'm sure our audience is uh, looking to hear all those stories. And actually, since everyone here is, is trying to listen to our stories about how to get into VC, um, and we have you know operators and founders uh, on the panel today, I would love to hear more about your each of your takes on like how do you build relationships with with founders? Um, you know what are like some key like what what do you value the most in those relationships? If anyone wants to, to take I'm happy to start. I mean, you know, I, I think for me, uh, it was like a pretty natural, um, I guess, progression for me around meeting founders. Uh, you know, when I um, was building my companies, pretty much all, most of my friends were were other founders. I did YC and, and the Till Fellowship and kind of really was able to build a, a pretty big founder network. And that was kind of how I was doing my angel investing, um, I guess, before it became institutional. It was just knowing interesting founders who were, you know, who were building interesting companies and um, and and being a very small part in their journey and trying to be helpful. And so I think for me, kind of as I transitioned onto the venture side, um, you know, the, the natural progression was trying to be the most helpful person I possibly could um, before an investment and after an investment and trying to be the kind of the venture fund, I guess, that reflected everything that I wanted in investors um, that, that I raised capital from with my companies. And and so I think the the founder to founder, not everyone on our team has a background of being a founder. Some were operators, some were other venture investors, some um, you know, from a finance background. And so everyone has slightly different ways of going about it. But for me, it's always like founder to founder. I think once you get that relationship, it, it, you know, in a very competitive market, it allows you to get more allocation and competitive deals. It allows you to, you know, prove your value early. And I think that kind of um, being able to relate is really powerful as well. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. You know, empathy is like also one of the key ones. Um, Pasquale, I'm actually curious to to know more about your opinion since you were also on the operator side. Who I think you're and muted. you're muted. <laughs> it has to happen at least once. It has to happen, yeah. right? Happen. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I guess um, it, I definitely wasn't in YC or had sort of this sort of crash course sort of expose into a bunch of founders or investors. So. Uh, you know, for me, and, and perhaps this is encouraging to hear for other people, but uh, I think you can build that uh, network with founders. Um, and I think I would really lean on the stuff that really interests you uh, and, and sort of stuff that you've had exposure to and sort of use that as a door into that world. And so, for example, for me um, in this company, a lot of what I was doing on one hand was sort of very much earth observation stuff. 
And on the other hand, it was sort of very climate focused. And so those are the conversations are st I started having. You know, initially it was with founders that were building things that I thought we could partner on uh, for the company I was working in. And sort of eventually, I think you hit sort of a critical mass where sort of network effects start to take place. And so I think it can feel very manual uh, or, or very sort of clunky at the beginning, but I think it's a game of patience in many ways and also of sort of staying honest to stuff that really interests you. Because I think if you're meeting people or trying to connect people and you don't really, you know, or you're, you're not really passionate about what you're talking about or what they're doing, I think that c comes across. And um, so, yeah, I think I would I sort, sort of really encourage leaning on the stuff that interests you or where you have perhaps a differentiated edge in some way and can can have an opinion on something early on. Absolutely. And, you know, I hope I hope the audience is uh, taking notes on all of our different uh, industries of favor so that uh, they they can later on reach out. But but yeah, um, Kate, any audio journalism passions that <laughs> we can we can bridge uh, oh, for gosh. searching? <laughs> um, well, no, I, th I think the only other thing I would add is, is two things. So one, I moved to London in January and so I think like always saying yes to events and yes to like opportunities to meet new people I think is like one way that I just try to you know meet different founders build rapport with different founders and then just being in like that yes mindset the whole time and then the other thing I think which is super valuable a friend of mine just spoke about this a couple of days ago to me he was he was telling me that you build your reputation as a VC off the past emails that you write so when you don't see a fit between the company that you're that you're looking at and like Seacamp in my instance, a lot of times it's very easy to brush that founder off and be like, well, I'm looking at something else now because you're so busy. But first off, you need to keep in mind that these people have dedicated their lives to this company, right? They're building something and their whole heart, their whole, like they're thinking about this 24 seven and not being respectful of that, I think is a huge flag and something that founders remember and founders also talk about to other founders. So I think being still helpful, as Nicholas said, but then also just like kind when you realize that this won't be a potential investment, I think is really important. Yeah, that's so true. I, I would, the only thing I would add to that is like, I think the best thing that can happen is that you pass on a founder, but they still refer you to other founders. I yeah. Think that's, 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 I think you've like kind of nailed it once you, once you start getting those referrals. Absolutely. And I think that's also part of, of the due diligence that founders need to do, right? Like. Um, you know, you shouldn't take like all the money of the world. You should like select your investors that you can work better with. Um, talking about due diligence, um, just to give more transparency to to our audience. Um, can we talk about, about, you know, different parts of the due diligence, the, the hard ones, the ones that you like, the ones that you do unexpectedly? Um, let's say, for example, I work at an impact fund and my, obviously my favorite part is impact measurement and management. Um, any, any favorite parts or also we can talk about the, you know, more dreadful parts <laughs> as well. I, I can, I can start this one because I think seed camp is due diligence in a very different way than like a, you know, place like a North zone from Prescott, for example. So we are a pre-seed and seed fund investing as the first institutional check into a company. At that point, you might have a company, it might not be incorporated, you might not have an MVP, it might just be one or two people. Like there is very little to due diligence at that point, apart from like due diligencing the founder through like founder reference calls or like asking around about the founder and just getting on a call to understand their product vision, their go to market strategy, like what they're thinking about building. And so I feel like Seedcamp has almost the, the benefit in many ways of like not really being able to do a lot of due diligence and more like going off like, you know, the minimal interactions that you do have with the founder. Um, so there's not like one thing I hate. I mean, after we invest, we do like a KYC report. I thankfully don't have to touch that. So that would be probably my least favorite if I had to do it. <laughs> yeah, Any, I mean, pretty good point. I, go I, I love that, you know, really understanding what kind of, diligence you'll be doing at different stages, I think is actually a really important thing when you're trying to decide what kind of fund you want to work at. And so, for example, if you're looking at a growth fund, your your day to day is going to be very, very different, right, than, than at a seed fund. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, as Kate mentioned, we do a little bit of seed, but 
we're rarely sort of the first institutional check and mostly focus on series a and and beyond and so at that point you, you are looking at more of a you know financial traction if you will but also the the things that i think matter early on are still incredibly important because there's such a long way to go right and so the founder um and, and founder references or some of the more traditional sort of market um due diligence you would do uh with experts in the field or trying to understand what their competitors are doing um is also is also helpful yeah and we're pretty similar we're first check uh, or second check in investors so pre-seed and seed and so quite similar to Kate. Um, I, I think for us, like we're very thesis driven. I, so I think most of what we do at the beginning, other than working out whether we think we can get on well with the founder and we believe in their kind of mission and what they're trying to do is really just working out whether we think the version of the world that they want to build is the version of the world that we kind of agree with and align with, but also um, kind of from a thesis perspective, we care a lot about defensibility. We care a lot about kind of step chain shifts. In, in big kind of categories and we and we care a lot about kind of the, the positive impact that they can drive and so for us a lot of our filtering is less around the specifics of the company other than the founder and the basic fundamentals of the business model but i think for us it's, it's very much just trying to work out whether what they're trying to build aligns with where we think the world's going and so we spent probably half of our time just trying to figure that out um, and obviously there's so many specifics that don't exist at the very beginning often it's one or two people on a pitch deck and so I think for us, we care less about the very specific um, things other than just like the base business model they plan to build, the base like opportunity they're going after and what they're trying to achieve there and and, and more about the kind of specific thesis items for us. But I think, you know, um, one of the points I, I, I think worth touching on here is like, if you think about it from the founder's perspective, obviously at different stages in, in, in the process of fundraising, whether it's pre-seed or seed versus like series A and beyond, obviously I think the most important thing is just managed expectations. So I think um, one of the things I think um, VCs can definitely do better in the diligence process is just being super clear as to what that process looks like from the beginning. I think it's, it's um, you know, having been on that side of the table, it's amazing how many conversations you have in parallel, how much stuff is going on. Whilst at the beginning of your company, there's so many things that are breaking every single second of the day. And I think the most valuable thing a VC firm can do is tell a founder what the process is going to look like and be really transparent and upfront about that at the beginning. Um, because I think that's really the, the kind of best way to ensure the relationship is like super smooth and super good from the offset. Um, and so I think that's that's one thing we've we we've learned and we've tried to implement now is like this is kind of what it looks like for a pre-seed. This is kind of what it looks like for seed. And as the company starting to mature and scale, if we're doing follow on, this is what it's going to look like on our side as well. That's awesome. I'm I'm actually kind of curious, Nicholas, um, since you focus on minority founders, as, as I understand, um, how do you incorporate that throughout due diligence? Yeah, so I'm, you know, we're. I think the purpose of the firm is is less specifically just to invest in minority founders, and more specifically to uh, try and give access to uh, capital and networks to those who don't have access to capital and networks. So for us, underrepresentation is both diversity, but also you know where people came from, whether they have access to the kind of networks that some people do um, inherently. I think you know if you're a second or third time founder and you live in Silicon Valley and you've raised capital before, there's a very specific path you can go on. You often don't need to raise a pre-seed. You often don't need to have that much. And so our whole strategy is around like, not just, I guess, whether we think the opportunity is interesting, but also whether we think we can meaningfully help the company. And for us, meaningful help is not just, we can connect you to these five people, but it's like, can we operationally kind of, you know, remove some of the roadblocks that, that kind of sit in, in the way for you. You might be a product centric founder, but have weakness around go to market. You might you know, have no network of talent to, to hire and have a really hard time hiring your first two or three people. And for us, it's trying to think about what those things are. And so we think a lot about portfolio success and a lot of our team spend quite a significant amount of their time on portfolio success, not just on investing. And so for us, like every time we do a deal, we assign two or three people on the team to that company, depending on what the company needs help with. Some of that is around network leverage. And, and we've built this kind of community that sits alongside TVC to kind of help founders connect with people they wouldn't be able to connect with ordinarily. Um, but I think um, part of that is just like operationally, how can we help? Like, is it around products? Is it around go to market? Is it around people? Like, what is that? And I think for us, that leans ourselves to supporting people that don't think they've got everything figured out um, uh, themselves. And I think that's a kind of a self-selecting process. And so that's meant that we have a pretty diverse funnel of companies coming in and, and a, a like very diverse portfolio relative to most other firms. And I think that's just kind of what we, we aim to be and aim to, to do. And we pass on companies where we just 
don't think we can be very helpful to the company and, and, and we just don't think that we can make that meaningful impact to them because that's a whole part of our strategy. It's like we start, we get to know people and we build our ownership and build our relationship with founders over time based on the goodwill of what we've built together as a, as a team and partnership. So. Yeah, no, and that that's amazing. That's a very good point, right? That the, the bulk of the work oftentimes comes in portfolio management, right? And that's that's a perfect segue as well to to talk more deeply about that, right? I'm I'm sure that um, since we have different uh, stage uh, investors in in this panel, like we can just talk a bit more about how that looks like, right? Like Kate, you investing from pre seed to see that's going to be looking totally different than than Pasquale, for example. Um, so why why don't you just tell us a bit more how how portfolio management looks for you? Yeah, um, absolutely. So so should I? I'll, I'll first talk about kind of what our approach to investing is and like what happens Let's and then it. what happens post investment in our because we we invest in a larger quantity of companies and I think your traditional VC would. So we do at this point because the market's so hot we probably do like a deal a week which I think is, again, much higher quantity than like doing 10 or 12 deals in a given year. Um, <clears throat> so the way we do it um, is, I mean, we obviously listen to loads of pitches. Um, we have loads of conversations. And then if there's a potential fit, then we bring them to the partner pitch stage, which is just a call with our entire investment team. Um, and then after that call, we do like our due diligence if there needs to be any. And then we have like a proper debate about the company and I think as Nicholas rightly pointed out, it's not just do we believe in the future that they're trying to create, but it's also who would be the POC, who would be able to be value additive to them. And if we don't see a fit, it doesn't make sense. Um, so that's a big part of kind of that debate process of like who would want to take this on to be like their point of contact as they build the company. So who would be the best partner there? Then in terms of portfolio management, you know, once they kind of get into what we call the seed camp nation, um, they have points of contact on the investment team who like the way I love to describe it is it's more like the the initiation of the funnel. So we like the, the point of contact, if I were a point of contact for a company, I am like their CRM. They come to me and then I funnel to like the relevant person who would be best suited for that question. So, you know, we, we have like biweekly calls and say that founder wants to be connected to one of our mentors or one of our experts in residence for like a product related issue or one of the LPs who in our structure, the LPs, a lot of times are venture capital firms. So if they want to be connected to any of these individuals or have questions about things that I don't know the answer to, then I would just be connecting them to other people in our network. And, you know, we've invested in 500 companies um, so far have kind of like a hundred plus mentor community, have EIRs. And so it really is just a matter of seeing who would be the right fit for any given question. Now, in terms of like their future fundraising, that is something that the investment team works hard on. So listening to pit, like listening to you know, them pitch to at the next stage, reviewing decks, um, being also just like an emotional support for, for those instances, that's something that our team would be doing. But I think a lot of times it's just being the CRM, being like that layer for like loads of different connections that we can help with the founder. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what you know, what each VC has like its own network, and that's like the the most uh, value that anyone can add, right? Um, I love the point about emotional support. Sometimes, like, I mean, Nicholas and and Pasquale, you you may want to like jump in, but sometimes you might just need somebody to hear you out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've I've often heard that uh, you know, yep, one of our partners has like on speed dial a kind of founders that I think I call him at odd hours of the night, and you know, I think building that kind of relationship of trust, which I, I think is harder to do with every every founder if if you're investing in five hundred companies, right? So it's different stages, um, but I think that's one of the things we try to do because to Kate's point, we invest in, in fewer companies every year. And so try to go deeper, perhaps, uh, on each of on each of them. And uh, Elena, uh, a partner that sort of helps on the talent side. And, you know, one of the most critical things as you're scaling a company is sort of hiring sort of key positions on um, as you grow. Right. And sort of having that support um, can be incredibly helpful uh, for, for the founders. Right. Um, so I think you know, to, to Kate's points, in many ways, it's it's quite similar to us. We 
try to go a bit deeper perhaps on on just given the nature that it's um fewer firms and, and in this but in the same way also try to you know open our our the rest of our our community um to them and so you know if, if somebody is building something around the payment space and we can connect them to the Klarna people right or if they're building something around community and they can talk to Hopin, um right that that sort of helps that can help founders um a lot and so i think that's part of uh, part of the value add that, that we want to bring but i think there's also two things which is one i think is sort of also stepping to the side and when 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 and, and sort of stepping in when it's most helpful and then the other one that i would i think we encourage founders that we want to partner with to do is sort of actually diligence us and talk to companies that we haven't backed or worth or that if we back but maybe the company you know ultimately was wasn't successful and talk to them about sort of how did this vc work with you guys when you know, things were not going super well and i think that can be as if not more important than the success stories uh, that vcs talk about absolutely and i think that that is also an interesting point for entrepreneurs that are coming from non-traditional emerging tech hubs right uh like as we have witnessed in the past almost two years, um, you know, entrepreneurship can happen besides, you know, beyond Silicon Valley. And I'm curious actually to hear um, whether you or your firms have been looking at like other tech hubs uh, beyond the, you know, pre-COVID <laughs> ones that you had said and uh, what sort of like challenges and, and opportunities have you seen? I mean, I, you know, from my perspective, we 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 built the firm to not be in Silicon Valley intentionally, and um, I, I think if anything, that you know, <laughs> the way the valuation environment is right now, and in, in particularly in and around Silicon Valley, I think um, in some ways it's an advantage not to not to be in Silicon Valley. But you know, I, I think um, the distribution and decentralization of where people build companies is very real right now, and I think that's an amazing thing for the venture ecosystem and an amazing thing for founders because I think it like really does. Um, Kind of democratize a lot of things i mean when i did yc we had to go to san francisco and i and it was very worthwhile being there at the time but we had to go to san francisco to partake in the program and that's very much not the case anymore you can be wherever doing the program um and i think that that was a kind of a pretty um that was a pretty big like shift it forced it was a forcing function in narrative from you've got to be in silicon valley otherwise you can't do yc to you can be anywhere and do YC and do it remotely. And I think that um, that distribution would also like mirror in, in capital distribution. There are VC firms popping up everywhere. Um, and I think that's a really um, healthy thing for the ecosystem as well, because I think that, um, you know, that, that, that kind of distributes capital into different pockets of society that don't ordinarily get that access. And so yeah, I think I think it's an overall kind of awesome thing. And I think that it's only gonna be positive for, um, for founders, particularly from underrepresented backgrounds. Absolutely. How, I'm I'm curious to see, um, you know, Pasquale, like, what, given that you're a bit later in the funnel, like, how have you seen it uh, from that side? Because I think for seed stage companies, um, a lot of people have started something. Uh, but how does it look at, at that later stage in the funnel? Like, do you still see companies from more the traditional hubs? Well, I think the, the 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 great thing about it is that you, after you've had you know a few successes of companies uh, from the non traditional hubs, you create sort of communities are created of people that now have knowledge of how to build sort of billion dollar companies that then sort of go on to do their own thing and or advise people in their community, right? And so it's maybe hardest for the first one, two, or three. But I think eventually you start sort of uh, hitting some sort of critical mass where it, it becomes increasingly possible. And I think to Nicholas's point, you know, because of the distributed nature uh, post COVID, people are also increasingly, you know, going to live other places as well. And so there's more movement of both talent and capital that sort of follows that. And I think that's the case, you know, in later in later stages as well. I think there's it's, you know, we're only seeing the beginning of it. I'm, I'm from Latin America. I think there's been a craze around VC this past year there today, right? Uh, uh, but um, but I think there's there's a lot more that sort of need, needs to happen, right? Uh, I, I don't think it's sort of 
uh, something we've we've solved. And I think it, you know, VC is one piece of of the puzzle, but there's there's a lot more that 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 goes into that as well. Yes, the, the world will always have problems to solve. That's the good part. <laughs> um, Kate, how are you dealing with it? Um, you know, investing in, in one company per week, having 500 portfolio companies do, you know, is portfolio management a very fun uh, scheduling assistant? <laughs> um, I mean, no, I, mean, I, I think, yeah, it, it's, it's a lot of companies to keep track of. I think maybe something to mention that Seedcamp like tells founders at the very beginning is that we're your best partners until your series A. And at that point, we kind of pass the baton because when you're like, for example, Hoppin, Hoppin, the, the founder, Johnny, like we invested at pre-seed, founder Johnny like worked at our offices for nine months and then he just took off and he doesn't want to be chatting to us on a weekly basis. He doesn't need our office space. He has plenty of that. Like, I think you just, you just need to know what you're good at in like as as part of like a venture capital firm and then just go to that and like you know where we don't invest at series b c d although we do like follow on investments into the companies that we have already previously backed um but so you really hyper focused on like kind of the earliest stage companies because that's where you can add the biggest value and that's where they don't have other partners so that's where you are the partner and so i think it's just a matter of prioritizing yeah amazing um I want to, before we move into, you know, a more industry related talk, um, I I want to get, you know, pick your brains on more like thinking for people who want to get into VC. Um, what has been your biggest learning, whether, you know, you self-realized it or maybe you have a mentor that like, you know, helped you through the process? Um, what what would be that uh, learning? I'm happy to to go first, as I think I may have been the one that has joined most recently. So it's 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 very fresh. Um, but I, I think a few things. Um, I'd, probably the first one is patience, uh, and I think it's just something that can take a short period of time or can take a very long period of time. And I think. Um, there's definitely luck involved, but I would definitely advocate for patience. Uh, I think it took you know, multiple months for me and, and I think multiple attempts. And I think, for instance, had I gotten the interview I had with Norzone at the beginning of the, my search, I probably wouldn't have gotten the job because I wouldn't have had the experience uh, you know, at the case studies or my understanding of where I wanted to focus sort of crystallized enough to, to get through that process. But having said that, um, I do think focus is probably one of the things I, I I found most helpful. And what I mean by that is really trying to understand what are the things you want to focus on? What is a stage? What is a sector? And that way you can also filter the kind of places you want to apply to or focus on and, and in a way be a bit more differentiated in your application and the kind of value you can seemingly provide for, for them. Um, I know that feels a bit abstract, but to illustrate it a bit more, I think when I started um, I started interviewing at a few growth places uh, in a geography that I don't, I, I wasn't, I think, necessarily uh, super interested in. Uh, and so it sort of takes maybe a few, a few runs to sort of narrow down what that looks like. Uh, but I would, I would, yeah, encourage sort of focus um, about and, 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 and patience. <laughs> I, th I think, I, th I think my learning has just been like I, I totally resonate with what you're saying Pasquale about having focus but then I'll, I'll kind of say the opposite like explore as much as you can in your like, in the realm of your hobbies and what I say with that is like you should really like I think people sometimes they have so many ideas for like side projects that they want to do but then they get like tired or like you know you end up saying well it's probably just maybe more valuable to like do one more case study prep and I like totally disagree with that. I think like the more creative you are on like your hobby side of things, like the more like if you're like interested in creating content, if you like, you know, are like an artist, like, I think the more you do on that, the more creativity you can see in the world. And I think in this, in like in this industry, like seeing the creative spirit behind the founder, I think is like one of the most valuable traits that you can have. And so I would say like focus on your hobbies because that's what I've done. And 
plus it doesn't burn that's, you out so that's good yeah. <laughs> that's also the difference between seed stage and later stage guys <laughs> in case <laughs> hobby <laughs> um awesome um nicholas learnings takeaways i mean i had a kind of a strange journey into vc so i i'm, I'm not sure it's necessarily the most like, applicable i mean for me it was i was angel investing a, a bunch and decided that i i should turn that into a firm and, and and start um working with with smart people that i respected and who had different perspectives um and i think that for me was I guess my foray in. So I guess um, probably not um, hugely relatable, but I, what I would say is when we built the firm and when we decided where we wanted to invest, um, you know, the whole uh, thesis building was really important to us. And I think that is applicable for other early you know, firms, you know, not firms that have been around for, you know, 40 years or whatever, but firms that are still relatively new. I think there's like a lot of leeway for incoming investors to build their own conviction around specific areas and spaces. And for us, that was this kind of transformative tech meets, um, you know, things that change the world for the better. And, and the micro categories for us were around kind of climate and sustainability and around healthcare. And then you know, lastly around kind of democratizing technology. So things that are kind of improving everyday outcomes for everyday people. And I think that that, um, you know, that, that came, came about in a very specific and intentional way, thinking about the things that we wanted to solve in the world. And so I think um, even if you're entering, you know, we, the people we've hired at the firm, there's eight of us full time and the, the people we've hired, um, you know, have all been people that have um, had their own very specific perspectives around the things that they want to do. And obviously they've needed to align with where we want to deploy capital. But I think for the people we've brought in, we haven't hired them because they were at HBS or they were at Stanford Business School or they, whatever, they had a big kind of brand name or pedigree. We hired them because they aligned with our values and mission and what we want to do. And obviously had some core competencies that we needed to bring into the team. Um, but I think that we very much thought about hiring based on thesis alignment more than anything else. I, I would add that w one thing that Nicholas says that I think is, is something that I definitely uh, saw is, you know, paths into venture are very, very different uh, for everyone, almost everyone I've spoken to. And I think when I, at the beginning, when I was asking for advice to, you know, people that are friends of friends that I knew that worked in venture, I think at first I felt like it was, hard to relate to some of their paths because they were so unique. But I think to Kate's point, that sort of telling of the value that some of these firms or most of them, I would say, place on having a unique path. And so totally echo Kate's point of sort of pursue your passions, whatever they are, and the more sort of, you know, non-normative that they are, probably the better because you have a differentiated take on something and, and you, you're, you're creative. And um, so, yeah, I, I think what Nicholas is saying is, is super accurate and, and you know, for example, in my case, I think coming from a management consulting firm wasn't something that we, I think, spoke once about in any of my interviews. It was more about I had decided to continue working for the startup throughout my master's program that was in China hours. And so, you know, it was a, a definitely an odd year, but it ended up being super helpful in sort of actually crystallizing that interest of mine and sort of being able to speak to that from the operational experience. and that ended up mattering more. And so would encourage absolutely doing sort of things that are not just sort of the, perhaps what would be on the recipe book. Yeah, the only extension I'd say to that as well is even in a generalist firm, I think it's much better to come to an interview with a strong perspective around things that you think are interesting and that you care about and that are passions of yours and have depth in that knowledge than know everything about everything in venture. Um, I think it, you know, even in a generalist firm, like it just it's so much more useful to have a well thought out perspective around a category or a couple of categories than than to know a small amount about every company that's been funded in every category um i, I think that's that comes across much better to me um, and but as long as you have like base lateral knowledge of the industry i think it's much more important to have a few things you care about yeah absolutely i guess that you know the diversity in in entries into vc can also be categorized as multidisciplinary as you will also see <laughs> later in the job um everyone in this panel has mentioned the words impact mission-driven companies sustainability climate um and that has been clearly one of the trends um that just accelerate got accelerated uh through covid right mission-driven companies that are catalyzed by technology. Um, 
is it the new AI? Like, do does anyone have strong feelings? Is it that every company will be a mission-driven company in 20 years? Uh, is it overhyped? Um, what's happening? Uh, I mean, I think it's all about the motivations for getting out, out of bed in the morning, right? So I, I like backing mission-driven companies because I believe that when things are tough, if you actually care about what you're building rather than purely looking for financial success, you're more likely to wake up in the morning and continue building that even in the, in the, in the times where things are tough. And so I wouldn't compare it to something like AI because I believe that enabling technologies can both be mission-driven and not mission-driven. And it's kind of like verticals versus horizontals. But I do think that um, over the next like 10 to 20 years, um, it's, it's, it's going to be increasingly important uh, for founders that I back. And I think founders that a lot of people back that, that the things that they're building and it, that doesn't mean that it has to be like curing cancer or so solving you know um, climate change in an absolute sense like it can be you know there's a whole variety of different versions of of, of impact but i do believe that um founder the founder caring deeply about what they're trying to solve is very important and i feel like that kind of purpose-driven uh mentality tends to be likely to be the kind of catalyst for a lot of founders in why they build those companies and so i do think that um, it will feature in almost all companies that that um, that do well over the next twenty years. Absolutely, I I think I would also add um, it's also part of the younger generation of investors like us um, who's entering the the landscape, right? Um, I don't know if if you're also seeing that seeing that in like the funder the founders that you that you fund right now. Kate, Pasquale, any speeches? <laughs> no, I can, I, can, I can go ahead. I mean, I mean, I think ultimately, like the biggest companies are the companies that solve like in may, in many ways, the most, like the biggest problems really like in short. Now in like a very scalable way. And then there's like, you know, a lot of companies that are solving massive problems. It's just much harder to scale, but like ultimately big problems create big opportunities. and so sustainability, climate, like the things that you discussed, I think every single person will like be affected in in some way. And so it makes sense that a lot of founders are tackling that big problem because it's just, you know, a big opportunity because it's going to affect everything. I mean, from like city politics to like every single business to day to day life of an individual. And so that's why it's an exciting space to look into. Um, I think on the impact, but I mean, Nicholas, you said it so well that like, you know, you really need to be backing founders that are like, you know, 100% convinced that like what they're building can like change the world and who have that passion. And a lot of that passion comes from having purpose in life, which a lot of times is associated with impact. And so you definitely see that um, because if you wanted to make money, I think there are a lot of easier ways than starting a company. You know, you could just take one a more traditional route. And so I do see a lot of founders who kind of have a huge drive towards impact. Yeah, I, I mean, I echo that. I, I was speaking to a founder earlier this week that's building a circular economy um, company around uh, sort of refills uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, one use containers. And it's, you know, he'll be the first one to admit how hard it is to drive behavior change, right? Like it's one of the hardest things to do. But hearing him, you know, it, it to him, it, will, it, like, it wasn't even part of the conversation that circular economy is a multi-billion dollar opportunity because it needs to happen that's a given and he will also be the first to admit that he he wasn't sure you know he's unsure if he'll be the one to sort of uh the, like be the unicorn there right but the opportunity is is just so clearly big financially and so and there's such an ethical imperative also added on that on top of that that it's that sort of en enthusiasm and sort of mission driven uh, opportunity is is just contagious also and and it's you know incredibly exciting to hear someone that is so passionate about about this talk about talk about it and and you also want to be part of that mission as well because it feels right right um i think you, the one thing that i think is also true is you will also see you know other companies that want to sort of bandwagon into the sort of climate or, or climate tech you know piece by you know offering some sort of climate friendly angle to it. And I think it's also important to be 
conscious of that and sort of call it out when you don't think it's it's the driving component right and i think um i'm not saying that's a majority by any means but i do think it's it's you know also calls for sort of to your point of whether this is something that everybody's going to do i actually think that's right it's paradigm shift right and sort of you're no longer going to sort of smoke inside restaurants right that, that that's sort of i, I right. feel like our sort of behavior change yeah. that everybody has, will have to adopt in some way or another um but it, it is it, it's but it's also sort of you have different companies right you you have companies that are sort of actually actively having a positive environment versus others that perhaps are just not having a bad impact and i think there's a wide spectrum uh in between yes. there certainly and like i you know I, I don't mean to say that like a b2b SaaS company that isn't like directly driving impact can't be a good business i just think that um it's easier to get out of bed in the morning on a rough day to build a company that's trying to solve climate change directly, maybe than sometimes than it is to to um, to you know build a company that isn't. That's not to say that there aren't founders who are perfectly capable of building massive companies in in categories that aren't solving climate change or other major issues. And so, um, yeah. Well, then I think, and, and then, yeah, no, I mean, I think Nicholas, just to just to echo and, and kind of jump off what you said, I think. It's also dependent on like you know if you're investing in an emerging country or not. Like although you mentioned, you know, are your firms looking at emerging countries? Like we did our first investment in Africa, um, in Nigeria, uh, in a company called the Clasha, um, and it's a borderless payments provider. So it helps companies in a country in in, in a continent like Europe, you know, be able to do transactions to Africa, um, and so Africans could more easily. Um, pay for, for European goods and so I think there are like it, it depends also like where your country is based and like what fintech yeah. what software problem they're solving yeah. because a lot of times like that can change you know individuals lives to in a, in a positive way so That's I think quite, impact yeah. is, um, is yeah, yeah it's why emerging markets are, big, are so big right now because there are still so many problems that are, that need to be solved that are fundamental problems that exist in in the you know in in the US or in Europe that don't exist in those those markets which haven't been solved yet that are less um i guess grandiose in solving climate change or or, or some big healthcare outcome there are like more fundamental issues to solve in a lot of places and i think that's like equally as exciting an opportunity yeah yeah no what i think what's also interesting there is like particularly around sort of thinking about carbon specifically i think it's given a renewed sense of uh you know voice perhaps to a lot of emerging countries that you know hold the vast uh, amount of uh, the majority of you know rainforest right and sort of uh, it sort of has catalyzed a bunch of companies uh, including you know for example Pachama coming from uh, an Argentinian founder right that and, and that closeness to uh, Brazil and and I think that's cool right like at, at the end of the day there's a lot of you can buy carbon credits and all this but at the end of the day if you're not protecting the Amazon uh, than, than, than why. <laughs> so I think that's also sort of a, a really cool opportunity for emerging countries. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love Pashama, by the way. Um, but but I think it, it's also interesting to look at, you know, global, uh, to Kate's point, basically, like, if you look at emerging markets, it's also, you, you look at globalized problems, but the angle of these companies are just like localized solutions, right? And that's what's so exciting about this um, borderless uh, tech ecosystem that we're seeing right now. Um, I want to spend the last um, minutes of this panel uh, giving you carte blanche for everyone and um, talking about, you know, your uh, tech prophecies uh, for the next 10 years. What's going to be interesting? What's going to grow? Uh, Pascual, we're waiting really to hear about this metaverse uh, <laughs> thesis of yours. <laughs> um, it's very, it's in very rough shape. Let's put it that way. But it's something I was thinking about uh, this week. And if I'm honest, I think I've been somewhat skeptical about the metaverse over the past few months. Uh, and I think one of the, but one of the thoughts that uh, made me change my mind, and I, I'll get. To that in a second but before i get to that i would i would caveat this by saying that when when i'm perhaps more bullish on the metaverse more broadly i think i don't mean a sort of uh surrogate you know alternate dystopian reality where we just live through the metaverse right to me it's more on sort of the augmented experience or augmented reality side uh, of the world but to bring it back to my original point 
I think one of the reasons I do see a sort of societal undercurrent that could provide some of the momentum you need to see solutions like uh, in the metaverse that would actually get a bunch of traction um, with with a, a, a sort of massive uh, appeal. To me, one of the reasons is sort of that, and this is very personal opinion and sort of reading, but I do think we're sort of edging largely due to digitization to sort of a post-state uh, um, you know, world. And I think in that sense, sort of when you think about historically, sort of a shared sense of national identity has been enough to identify holders that you, ident that you sort of feel closest with or you optimize for it within a nation state. I think as that sort of largely gets eroded over time, a, you might find affinity to others more closely in the metaverse, right? Over other characteristics that are not necessarily just the place you're you are born. And similarly, you know, if if NFTs, you know, back if you're if you're thinking about CryptoPunks, uh, may seem ridiculous at, at times to some people. I think if you think about it as uh, you know a building block of sort of modern society, which is sort of private property, or right, then if you combine those two things i think i couldn't tell you exactly what it's going to look like but at least those two things to me um are exciting and i think there's 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 something there uh that merits merits attention but i i'm i welcome any dissents dissentment no if, if so i i that's an extremely interesting way to like co combine like your thoughts about political science with like this this you know start of of the metaverse world um Super, super interesting to hear that. I think, to be honest, this is just, I feel like I'm like on the bandwagon a bit late, but I feel like a couple of weeks ago, it was like the first time I was like, wow, I'm probably going to buy an NFT sneaker sometime soon. Like <laughs> the first time I was like, I'm not like, it's going to be, it might be like a, not a minority small thing. Because when I think about like, when I get, get up in the morning, I make coffee and I'm in like the real world. And then I sit down and if I'm working remotely from home, I zone into like emails, which is like my like, house inbox almost like I'm like literally entering a different world so it's already happening but it seems very unreal and so I think all these like additions of like you know being able to close I have like an nft sneaker like that I think that's just ways to make this digital world that we already live in and spend so much time in more authentic and this is the first time I was like wow this is not going to be horribly scary like there could be a, a, a good outcome of something like this you know, whether it's like having like NFT, I mean, Seedcamp has, has done loads of, of NFT bets and we're really um, bullish on this space. But I think this is a couple of weeks ago, it was like the first time it just dawned on to my head. I was like, wow, this is not going to be just a minority. Like this could be happening because we are already living in the web in so many different ways. Yeah, I mean, look, on, on that topic, I would, I mean, I could talk for hours, but I, I think I'm inclined to agree that the kind of bridge between the physical and digital world is like inevitably here to stay, both from like a political and, and, and you know, geopolitical, I guess, stance, but also financial infrastructure. And there's a whole bunch of things going on there, which I think are very interesting, like disintermediation of the middleman in business models. I think new incentive mechanisms for creation and engagement. There's a whole bunch of amazing stuff, I think, going on that you can use um, you know, blockchain, crypto and, and you know, NFTs and every, you know, the whole category for um, with both within the metaverse and outside of the metaverse. I think other areas I think are really interesting right now. Um, I think kind of um, the evolution of the space economy and actually the reality that exists in the very near term of what we can do both from a R and D telecoms, you know, bio manufacturing, et cetera, perspective in space. Now that, there are viable um, you know, ways of accessing space right now. I think that's pretty interesting. I think the kind of um, synthetic biology category is still super interesting and nascent, everything around kind of the kind of, kind of data meets biology um, kind of category. And there's so many different things there, both in climate and in healthcare. Um, there's loads of, there's loads, I mean, on like quantum and what's going on with quantum. And I think that's actually a, probably a less than 10 year reality as well. And that changes the game for a lot of things as well. So I think there's some really interesting deep tech um, innovations that are going on right now that will, I really think the, the, the rails that we run the world on right now will be completely different in 10 or 15 years from now um, in, in all different ways. So that's like com computers, that's like biology, that's financial infrastructure. I mean, there's like so much stuff going on right now. The rate of innovation is, is, absurdly fast um, which is very cool yeah there's um 
there to Kate's point about oh I don't know if I jumped on uh, late to this bandwagon uh, I think in in you know both um, it, well basically every industry that you you all mentioned metaverse synthetic bi biology space um, it seems like everything is happening in a week but recently I, I listened to this podcast that defined it to me very clearly that was like we are you know short term late but long term super early yeah, agree. and you know the next 10 years are just going to be super fast and super exciting yeah i i would also use that cue to say you know no topic is too scary and i think try and just dive into it and eventually maybe you know i think you'll get there and, and i i i felt the same way i think with kate i feel a bit late to that bandwagon but i think yeah, if it takes you to write one good podcast or something to sort of maybe spark your curiosity in a way and and, and spend time on it. And, you know, one last thought that I think I, that I been, one thing I've been thinking about a lot is and, and, and sort of going off of the AI uh, trend is we I think are very like fairly close to AGI, like artificial general intelligence. And I think we're not talking enough about how to regulate or make decisions. Uh, about those systems. And so I think, you know, basically where I'm going with this is, you know, AI ultimately is about optimizing a set of outcomes, right? Or optimizing a certain group of individuals or for the benefit of a certain group of individuals. So how do you define who those stakeholders are? If, is it the customers of a company? Is it, again, those with a national, like, shared national identity? Is it those with certain affinity? Should it be, and going back to climate change, current generations as opposed to future generations, right? Because short-termism has largely right. gotten us where we are today. But that brings some very scary questions about, you know, uh, the more short-term nature of how we appro like approach democratic processes today. Uh, so yeah. and I don't want to open that kind of worms, but that's something I'm thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> Same with financial technology as well. I mean, the decentralization of like the financial infrastructure and governance infrastructure of society is like the same kind of, kind of worms from a different angle. And then also how you build companies like Pascal, you were mentioning you were speaking to like a circular economy, um, you know, startup that uses a different business model. And I think there are a lot of exciting things on, on happening on not just what you build, but how you build it. Totally. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much. If you have any last thoughts uh, to encourage the audience to get into VC, more companies, more investors, we need everyone. <laughs> Uh, here, um, but I want to thank you all so much for for being here today, and uh, please uh, keep investing in mission driven companies. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks so much.